talking about if had Jocko Pistorius lived, and of course he did the Jocko video back in the day, uh, would Jocko have gravitated towards the extended range bass? My guess is yes, because Jocko was always into new things and new sounds. I know he took uh, Joni Mitchell's very first acoustic amp, and he was always working with pedals and things like that. So I think when the extended range bass became a little bit more practical and, and well-designed, better designed, I should say, I think Jocko would have gone five and six string. What say you, Jerry? I say no. <laughs> okay, well, that goes, there goes that theory. And and why why do you say Jocko would have stuck with four? Well, he loved the bass, the, the pure bass and the instrument itself. Okay. And the four strings make you play like a bass player. Right. Because you have less to work with and the, the more foundational. Mm -hmm. um, you, it's just a set, different head. It's very hard to play six strings with taste. And I feel mm. very few people can play tastefully normal bass parts or even extended bass parts with taste. The oh. sound is sound is different, that low B string or the high C string. Okay. It gives you just a different um it's a different instrument. Well, yeah. let me bring let me introduce you to David C. Gross, who is a six string bass player. And I've got to tell you, interesting I never played the six string bass. I played a five string bass in the um, 90s and 80s when it was required mm -hmm. and things. And uh, the six string bass, we've talked with Dave Swift. We've, uh, David, you've uh, talked with Anthony Jackson, and they feel that the real mm -hmm. bass guitar is the six string guitar because, as we know from history, Leo wanted to se sell uh, Fender bass to upright bass players to, you know, reduce the wear and tear. And it, it was easier, uh, mobility was a lot easier. Hence mm -hmm. the bass guitar was four strings to, so he could sell it to bass players. But mm -hmm. folks such as David Swift and Anthony Jackson maintain that the true bass uh, guitar is the six-string bass. Now, my partner, David C. Gross, is quite the six-string bass player. And we've been, I playing, see. We've been <laughs> playing yeah, with pink strings and all. We've been playing gigs around town. And when David and I did a couple of blues gigs together, um, folks were astounded how, how David played the six-string, played blues on the six-string bass without, I would say, being overbearing on the upper or lower register. So the six-string bass, I think, can be played just like any other bass, David. It can be. Well, you know, the, the thing is, the way, the way I look at it, particularly from a studio perspective, is within the first three frets, from low B to high C, you have two octaves of D. So for me, it made sense. And a, a lot of... The, Back in the day, a lot of uh, Sony used to do a lot of karaoke in Japan. And one of the ways they uh, were able to do this as, as um, uh, abundantly as they did is they would call me to change keys. So if something was in, let's say, A, they want to bring it down to, let's say, a, an E flat or something, I could I could do, do it that way. But I think the key... Uh, for me in particular, and remember, you know, I I I I was one of Willie's subs, so he wouldn't be uh you know thinking that I'm gonna, you know, slop up the joint. I mean, Harold Wheeler mm -hmm. loved, you know, the fact that I could read his charts. And uh the thing is, once you were it, as as long as you you grew up playing bass, it, it if you know, I I I, I would um I would say that for me, I hear it that way, and 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 visually, I see it that way. Victor Gaskin used to um, be my instructor, and he loved when I would do <laughs> a Bach cello sweeps mm -hmm. and go. Da -da -da -da. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so for me, I always thought low. Um, as a matter of fact, on this six string, I have a double stomp on the low B. I can actually get a G. Now, Whoa. of course. It will make you go to the bathroom. However, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great low note. <laughs> yeah, it's a great low note <clears throat> for sure. So, can we yeah, can sure. we can, can we say that the really the, the six string bass is more dependent on the player and how he oh, or she approaches it as opposed to every, the instrument? Every instrument. So, um, I like it's funny when you mention all the ideas about um playing six string is great. But one thing with like playing four string, it makes you be, become more creative. And creativity comes from a lack of something. 
So you become, I would say, I would say you become less creative playing six string because you have so much available to you hmm. and you list, you miss that struggle of having to invert a line and play that, go down as low as you can and then jump back up playing an octave higher to have the line make sense. And it makes beautiful music as opposed to everything that you can hear going a scale line all the way down to the bottom as opposed to going part way down and jumping back up to the middle. It's more musical and more lyrical and more, has a more a groove to it that it's more, you can get more uniqueness out of it as opposed to the same old thing. You can hit a whole two octaves. Yeah, that's great, easy. But the challenge of making music comes from, I think I say creativity comes from a lack of something as opposed to having an abundance of something. Well, let's, really let's that, that's an interesting perspective. I've been doing these, we've been doing these um, shows and video series about me defending the 80s. And one of the reasons I defend the 1980s as a generation, uh, you know, pop music, jazz, rock, uh, rhythm and blues, mm -hmm. et cetera, is not so much the artists and, and the songs, okay? You know, Sly Stone spoke to his generation. Prince spoke to his generation. James Brown spoke to his generation when it came to funk and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. But because all these things came to fruition, such as the DX7 and, and electric basses, their sound improved with uh, active electronics and onboard uh, electronics, now we could hear the bass. It was not a low hum on the bandstand or on the recording studio. Now with the DX7, you could do string arrangements and, and play them in the bar. You didn't, you know, it wasn't string arrangements now or orchestral arrangements weren't just for rock stars who can afford an orchestra. Mm -hmm. Now, now you know, the bar band guy could go out there and do sorts yeah, of things. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It's, yeah. you know, this whole idea of digi digitalization and synchronization and synthetic synthesizers and drum machines has mm -hmm. leveled the playing field where anybody can make music, has the okay. tools to, to make music. And depending upon how to, how creative the person is with them right. and have the level of um, they want to invest in natural sound as opposed to synthetic sound, right. it's a matter of, you know, where you are, what you're about doing. Um, right. There's a lot of things involved. It all comes down to the individual. You, when you did the uh, Jocko video, I mean, so many people cite that now, and of course, it's it's you know, it's on YouTube, it's everywhere, it's ubiquitous. When every when anybody wants to know about Jocko, they go to that video. When when you did that, I know Jocko wasn't in the best of health uh, then, but did you have a sense that you were capturing history when you were doing that video, or was? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I knew what was going on. Yeah. Um, he came to me. Um, and I saw in him what I saw in me. With the yeah. problems I had all my life. So we like, you know, it's like nothing had to be said. We just took care of business and got it done. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, just as simple as that. And I, you know, like he, he like everybody else, they, they heard the desperation in my sound, the, the energy that I put out. Mm -hmm. And he became a fan, you know, based upon that. I didn't know. And when I heard him for the first time in 1974, I said, damn, somebody put the work in. Because <laughs> he, was, he wasn't... <laughs> He yeah. wasn't playing anything that was not that and imagined to play, but he did it. Right, you know? right, right. So it was cool. Then I find out eight years later, seven years later, he was I'm his inspiration. Right. And I, I got that too. I yeah. underst I understood that. So he came to me yeah. like I had a feeling of, you know, who he was and what was about and where he was now and the troubles he's going through and, you know, the depression. Right, true. Um, all the things called that. Everything I've lived, what he lived with, there's no, it wasn't a stranger to me. Okay. Um, so we got it done. We got it done. I was in trouble myself at the time. I talk about that in my book too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the, the thing that I think was most poignant for me is when he, uh, when you had said, Jocko, you're, you're this, 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 and he said, Hey, <laughs> get me a gig. That yeah. broke my heart. Yeah. You know what I mean? Very yeah, it was heartbreaking. That's uh,